This is one of a series of Good Answers presentations, offering evidence to answer skeptical challenges to the Bible's accuracy. This talk, though, begins not with the Bible, but with a secular novel written by H. Ryder Haggard in 1893. It all arose from a discussion between Haggard and his brother. They were talking about a very popular novel that had just come out a couple of years before and had captured the reading public's imagination. You may know it, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Well, Ryder Haggard had some skills as an author, and his brother, much impressed by Treasure Island, said, Bet you couldn't write anything half as good as that. Haggard said, How much would you bet? They agreed on five shillings. Just six weeks later, Haggard had just about completed his manuscript, which he called King Solomon's Mines. It went like this. Its protagonist was called Alan Quartermain, a highly respected white hunter, whose safaris in Africa had yielded just what his clients wanted, elephants, rhinos, lions, and more. But, weary of it all, he was ready to give up the business. When a fellow Englishman approached him, he said his brother was missing in Africa, and he begged Quartermain to locate him. Reluctantly, Alan assembled a party, but before they set out, a tall, mysterious African asked to go with them. They had their full complement of guides and bearers, but the man said he would work for them without pay, because he just had to go, and so he did. The safari then plunges deep into Africa braving rivers, mountains, jungles, deserts, and all kinds of dangers, until they come upon a forgotten kingdom. And there they discover that their mysterious companion is rightful heir to the throne, which his evil uncle had usurped. Conflict ensues, and with Alan's help, the true king regains his position. In gratitude, he helps Quartermain to locate and rescue the missing brother and to find mines overflowing with gold, silver, and precious gems. Well, Ryder Haggard offered that manuscript to several publishers, but each one said that it was too outlandish. Readers would hate it. But finally, one publisher took the chance and proved the others wrong. It became the best seller of the year, 1895, and the printer could not keep up with demand. That novel has continued to be popular down to today. So far, six feature films have been made about it, and there may be more. But where did Haggard get the idea for King Solomon's Mines? Why, in the Bible, of course. He had read Second Chronicles 9, 20 through 22. Quote, all King Solomon's goblets were gold, and all the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver, because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's day. The king had a fleet of trading ships manned by Hiram's men. Once every three years it returned, carrying gold, silver, and ivory, and apes and baboons. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. Solomon had, it seems, a source of great riches. Much of it came via this fleet, which King Hiram of Tyre provided to him. And on a three-year cycle, they brought back a cargo of gold, silver, ivory, apes, and baboons. From where? The Bible doesn't say. But ivory, apes, and baboons suggest a source in Africa. 
That, of course, was Haggard's conclusion, and it paid him richly. But now we have left the realm of fantasy novels and referenced the Bible. King Solomon's mines must have been real, and the treasure real. Where were they? Alas, no one knows. To this day they have not been found. But that's not the end of our story, because the Bible also references another set of King Solomon's mines, his copper mines. Remember when the people of Israel were emerging from their forty years in the Sinai and about to enter Canaan? Deuteronomy 8, 7 through 9 tells us this, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Copper? Not as rare as gold, perhaps, but a source of wealth and power and vital to any kingdom in the ancient world. Household items, statuary, weapons, armor, and more were derived from copper, either pure or alloyed with tin to form bronze or with zinc to form brass. Solomon would have needed a lot of it, and he obviously had it. But from where? That question brings us to Nelton Gluck, an American rabbi and pioneer biblical archaeologist of the early 20th century. He spent years surveying in Palestine, identifying many promising archaeological sites. While exploring south of the Dead Sea, down here, he came upon evidence of copper mining in a region that had bordered Israel and the nation of Edom in antiquity. Could this perhaps be the source of Solomon's copper? It was a fascinating idea, but the scholarly world did not endorse it. It seems that, as archaeologists turned up evidence, their finds made Dr. Gluck's idea less and less likely. Here's a quote. By the 1980s, however, Gluck's claim had been largely dismissed. A consensus had emerged that the Bible was heavily edited in the 5th century BCE, long after the supposed events, while British excavations of the Edomite highlands in the 1970s and 80s suggested the Iron Age had not even come to Edom until the 7th century BCE. That's Science Daily uh, from 2008. Let's unpack that statement because it has huge implications for our trust in the Bible. In effect, they're telling us that Edom was not a real nation. No major metalworking, no kings, basically a tribal society. So let's mark that here. Archaeology says no Edomite kings before the 7th century BC. Now, compare the Bible history. It says Israel's first kings were Saul, David, and Solomon, who reigned beginning in the 11th century BC. But Israel was rather slow to adopt kingship. For centuries after entering Canaan, God provided them with judges or saviors like Samson, Deborah, and Samuel, who arose to lead when duty called them. But God's system didn't satisfy them. We must have a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations. Our king will judge us, go out before us, and fight our battles. For Samuel 8. 19 and 20. And those nations with kings included Edom. 
quote, These are the kings, eight of them, who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. Genesis 36, 31. Okay, if Edom was so advanced before Israel's first king, then its kings must belong to the 11th century or earlier. But now, come back to the archaeologists. Can you see the problem? They say Edom only reached this stage of development in the 7th century. So, what happens to Israel's history? The Bible account of Saul, David, and Solomon centuries earlier, according to scripture, must be wrong. Notice, though, that the scholars have an explanation. The Bible account was heavily edited in the 5th century, some 500 years after the fact. No wonder, then, that the Bible got it wrong. So, here's what the skeptics were saying. Contemporary scholarship argued that because there had been no physical evidence no Edomite state had existed before the 8th century BC. Until the current discovery, many scholars had said the Bible's numerous references to ancient Israel's interactions with Edom could not be valid. Science Daily once again. We can simplify this argument, I think. First, there was no nation of Edom in the 10th century BC to be a rival of Israel, as the Bible claims. Second, there was no Israeli kingdom in the 10th century BC either. All that business about Israel's first kings, like Solomon, was invented in the 5th century BC. Sounds bad for the Bible, doesn't it? Uh, but wait. That article says the skeptical view held sway until the current discovery. What's that? That was the entrance of Professor Tom Levy of the University of California, San Diego. In 2002, he was able to fund and begin excavations in the same area Rabbi Gluck had explored over half a century before. Here's a shot of Dr. Levy and his party of volunteers at the site. Quote, Excavations at Kerbat and Nahas were part of the Jabal Hamrat Fidan project and carried out under the auspices of the University of California, San Diego and the Department of Antiquities of Jordan. Kirbat and Nahas. The Arabic name actually means ruins of copper. Dr. Levy dug for several seasons there, and here's what he found. There was indeed a major copper mining industry there. This false color topographic map shows the location. It's not in the highlands where the British had dug, but farther south. Here's a quote. The Edomite lowlands, home to a large copper ore zone, have been ignored by archaeologists because of the logistical difficulties of working in this hyper-arid region. But with an anthropological perspective and using high-precision radiocarbon dating, this new research demonstrates two major phases of copper production during the 12th to 11th centuries BC and the 10th to 9th centuries BC. Uh, note that period of time. We'll come back to it in a minute. In this period, evidence was found of construction of massive fortifications and industrial scale metal production activities, as well as over 100 building complexes. Science Daily, once again. Here's an aerial view. You can see a large square ruin there. 
But notice all that black coloration round about? It's prominent enough and large enough to be seen in satellite photos. What is that? Well, it's slag, the remains of copper refining, and it covers some 24 acres and is some 20 feet deep. Tens of thousands of tons of slag, the residue of many years of refining. Now, copper ore has to be heated to 1,981 degrees Fahrenheit to separate out the metal. Here's how they did it. Workers would tread on bellows to blow air through tubes directly into the smelting furnace so as to raise the fire to the critical temperature. Hot, dangerous work, and we have evidence of that from the many graves found at the site. Several seasons of digging produced solid evidence for Dr. Levy's people. Quote, the 2006 dig has brought up new artifacts and with them a new suite of radiocarbon dates placing the bulk of industrial scale production at Kerbat and Nahas in the 10th century BCE in line with biblical narrative on the legendary rule of David and Solomon. That's a, as you see, UC San Diego news press release from October of 2008. But who actually owned and operated these mines? They're in an area that was on the border between Israel and Edom, but the dating shows us which of these countries would have controlled them. The most active period was the 10th and 9th centuries BC, and that was the period of David and Solomon when those kings dominated Edom. Those graves we saw most likely were for Edomite workers, perhaps slaves, who were mining copper for shipment to Israel. Well then, Dr. Levy's excavations have shown us the remains of a major copper mining complex with hundreds of buildings, countless tons of slag from the smelting process, and graves of those who worked there. An artist's rendering shows how it might have looked. The mines are on the border between Edom and Israel, and the industry peaked at a time when Israel was dominant. Once more we see that the Bible is accurate right down to incidental statements, such as when it assures the Jews that, quote, you can dig copper out of the hills. After all, if these are not Solomon's copper mines, then whose are they? But our story is not quite over. We may have found King Solomon's copper mines, but recall where we started? The king had a fleet of trading ships manned by Hiram's men. Once every three years it returned, carrying gold, silver, and ivory, and apes and baboons. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. From where did those exotic animals and precious metals come? Someone still has to find, perhaps somewhere in Africa, King Solomon's mines. Could it be you? If you have questions about this lecture or any of the others in the Good Answer series, you may address them to me, Dr. Jerry C. Four, at yahoo.com.